Please welcome Senior Director, Developer Relations, Samsung Electronics America, Lori Fraley. Welcome to day two of Samsung Developer Conference. How's everybody doing? I'm Lori Fraley, and I'm so thrilled to host the Spotlight session today. Let me tell you why. As the Senior Director of Developer Relations for Samsung Electronics America, I work on helping you make your app's world domination goals a reality. It's really a passion for me personally. Yesterday, Samsung teams came from all over the world to talk about the tools you need to build, scale, and launch your ideas on our platform. We geeked out on new tech. We worked out with a skimble trainer. How many of you went on the Under Armour run this morning? Wasn't that fun? But that's what Samsung is all about, bringing high concept technology to real world applications. It's an exciting time, and this is where it's all going down. Today, it's all about you, our awesome developers. Woohoo! Let's hear it for the developers! <laughs> Did you check out Day of the Dev last night? It was a night of tricks, treats, and tacos. I especially love the pumpkin paintings and sugar skulls. And if you didn't get a chance, I encourage you all to experience Delusion. It's an XR activation based on a VR horror fantasy about an author who goes missing. Two of her biggest fans go to her mansion looking for her, but all they find is her last book. It's so realistic, you'll feel like you're immersed in all the action inside the mansion. Yesterday, we also announced the winners of the Mobile Design Competition and the Best of Galaxy Store Awards. That's where our editorial team recognizes publishers who stand out from the crowd. Speaking of crowds, can you believe the Bixby Marketplace has doubled in size? You can get the tools and documentation to build your capsule with Bixby Developer Studio. Meanwhile, at Code Lab, 15 exhibitors from Bixby, Knox, Kaizen, and more will host 29 hands-on challenges and lessons for attendees. Stick around, because later on, we'll be speaking with the genius behind Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin. Now join me in kicking off the Spotlight session. I'm honored to bring to the stage a visionary executive who has spent his life applying technology to fixing profoundly human problems. Head of Enterprise Mobile, GM of Mobile B2B, Samsung Electronics North America, Tahir Bebiani. Um, I was in the last semester of my undergraduate studies, engineering school. And one day, at 4.30 a.m., I walked to the emergency room at the university hospital, and I checked in. They immediately rushed me to the back and told me to wait. I was really nervous, was actually quite scared. You see, that day, I had brought with me a piece of equipment, a device made in a lab, and the purpose was to measure the currents flowing through a body of a patient during surgery. And that day, I was about to see my very first surgery and test this device. And that day happened to be a pediatric surgery. I will never forget that experience and the rest of the semester where I spent time in that hospital. Later on, I began to write code for medical devices and diagnostic radiology equipment. But I tell you this because I had a sense of pride of being an engineer. I had a sense of purpose because I felt that what I did in some fashion would end up in some big discovery 
or become part of a diagnostic device or, or a new medical equipment. So today, standing here with you, I have to tell you I'm really fortunate to work with a team that focuses on solving complex problems, meaningful problems that impact our lives. Let me give you a few examples. The rate of readmission for cardiac patients in the US is about 15%. That means 15% of patients don't listen to their doctors and end up back in the hospital. This, of course, is not good for their health, <clears throat> but it's also quite expensive. Last year in the US, the cost of readmission was $41.8 billion. Kaiser Permanente wanted to do something about this. So they use our Samsung Galaxy watches <clears throat> and are running the, uh, the app that monitors the heart rate and movement, and they post these data to a physician's dashboard. The physician reviews these, monitors, and gives feedback to the patient. Kaiser provided these to 2,300 patients. 87% of these patients completed the procedure and their exercise as they were supposed to, compared to only 50% that's normal US standard the readmission rate dropped to 2%. This was very successful, and Kaiser is now rolling it out to the rest of the country. Another example. When I landed here a few nights ago in San Jose, I could smell the smoke because of the fires. When I called my cousin, she lives up in Moraga, she said that she doesn't have any power. Unfortunately, this year is another uh, year of fires in California. And last year was severe and quite tragic. In 2018, 8,500 fires burned in California, and lives were lost. 50 miles away from Los Angeles, Corona Fire Department started using drones to increase their situational awareness. And what they also did was they paired these drones with devices, with Samsung Galaxy devices and tablets that were running software developed by the Air Force so they could monitor the fires and manage their own resources. So they improved the safety of their own crew and also they saved lives in that area. It was a success. Another example. 77% of us when we go to a bank to manage some type of a financial transaction that is complex, prefer to talk to someone that is an expert, that knows something about what we're asking. But it turns out this, the number two reason that people actually switch banks is because they don't have a good experience in a bank. So that means every time you walk in a bank, you're likely to leave unhappy, and that's a big problem for banks. HSBC wanted to solve this. So what they did, is again, they took the watches, Samsung Galaxy watches. This time, they developed a custom app with special greetings. So when I walk into a bank, somebody in the front would, would meet me and ask me a question, like transfer funds, open a bank account, or, um, or have a question about a mortgage. And then the, per, the, the, the bank staff would then send me to the right person, the expert. I get the sense that I'm getting white glove treatment because an expert is addressing my needs. And the bank, of course, becomes a lot more efficient. Magna is the world's third largest distributor of auto parts in the world. It's a $40 billion company. The average downtime in Magna's assembly lines is about 10%. That's actually a very big number, because Magna has 350 different plans all over the world. So any downtime has a ripple effect across. So Magna asked Samsung to help. And they integrated our tablets and our watches into their smart factory initiative that uses AI, VR, and IoT. Samsung and Magna work together. Now their, their downtime has dropped by 6% to 
and Magna is now getting a lot of financial benefit from it. In fact, they're paying, getting an immediate payback from the technology investment they made. I give you these examples because they're complex problems to solve. And I have to tell you again, as a technologist, as somebody who's interested in all the new uh, innovations, I'm incredibly lucky and fortunate to work with an amazing team. This is a Samsung B2B team. And today, it's really my pleasure to introduce this team to you formally. Samsung is actually quite significant in the B2B space. We have about a billion devices installed globally that serve businesses. We serve 15,000 enterprises on a global basis. 2,000 of these enterprises are here in the US. We also serve SMBs and entrepreneurs, several hundred thousand of these in the US through our partners. The US is a big market for us. 40% of our revenues come from the US. 2019, this year, was a successful year for us. We grew our mobile revenues by 20% and doubled our tablet sales. The reason I share this with you is because B2B is a growth area for all of us, for app developers and our ecosystem partners. And we expect this growth to continue into the next few years, driven primarily by three main reasons. First, the device landscape is still growing. And this growth is driven primarily by what we call industrial devices, purpose-built devices. Number one, businesses are now automating their processes. They're moving from the manual system to automated systems. Also, many companies bought devices and products, let's say five or seven years ago, and these are now all being end of life. Number two, uh, we see a movement away from single, single purpose devices. So think scanners. Companies now want to collect information, capture information, process it on the device, connect to the cloud, communicate, display, and store this information. They, these, these types of applications need um, smartphones, smart tablets, the types of products that we make. Finally, process automation, which is taking shape in a lot of the industrial companies and enterprises that we see. Companies are now uh, using very sophisticated smart software, typically cloud-driven, to automate their processes. And this smart software requires smart devices. So now they're able to get data, insight, and, and optimize their operations. The second big reason behind the growth of B2B is a whole new generation of networks. So you all know that 5G is being rolled out commercially, and you know that Samsung is the leader in devices and network elements. But what's also happening is that companies um, are now deploying 5G networks and private networks in a factory, an office building, or an industrial zone. They use 5G, CBRS, Wi-Fi, all this new technology, or a combination thereof. We call these private networks because they're focused on a geographic area or they're designed to specifically meet, uh, meet the demands or the requirements of a specific business. Now, what we do as Samsung is we partner with our service provider partners, carriers, industry partners, and we focus the infrastructure and the device investment for the private network. We develop a model for CapEx and OpEx. We can help finance these. We can help provide turnkey solutions and help operate these. This is a big growth area for us. Finally, in addition to these new devices and networks, the B2B apps are changing. And apps are changing because first of IoT. You've heard a lot about this, and you'll hear more. 
in the B2B space, IoT is very big. McKinsey says 127 new IoT elements are added every second. And they predict that in the next five years, $4 trillion of savings will happen just in the factory space, primarily because of technology savings and operational efficiency. But it's not only factories. Last week in New York, we saw a startup during our hackathon with Verizon that had basically uh, put sensors all over a truck and would gather information to improve the truck safety and make the road safer for all of us. The second area of growth is AI. AI is growing at by about 60% per year. A few years ago, it was only $2 billion. In, by 2025, AI is going to be $130 billion market. And when I talk about AI, I'm talking about industrial AI and the types of AI we use in business. One example is our own solution, which is Next Job. Software embedded in our displays. When a customer walks by in a store, the software grabs the information, runs analytics, and then provides content relevant to the customer on the fly in real time. So the experience is really different and very unique for all of us. Finally, there's edge computing. Now, edge computing market is growing about 30% a year. Uh, the uh, size of the market is about $9 billion in about, by about, let's say, three to four years. But what's really important, Gartner says that by 2025, 75% of all information is processed at the edge versus 10% today. So that means processing will basically move to where it's needed. So we'll get access to the types of applications, let's say hypercloud or massive parallel processing for let's say image processing, for data and content distribution. So think sports, think medical imaging and I think augmented reality finally becomes a reality, primarily, again, in industrial and B2B applications. So let me put all of this together. Devices, networks, and a whole new range of applications which are now emerging in the B2B space. When you put them all together, something interesting happens, and we see this working with our partners. We notice that companies are not just renovating. They're not going from version 1.0 to version 2.0 or 3.0. In fact, companies are not even evolving. They're not taking an old business model and going to a new one. Companies are breaking up. They're combining technology innovation in addition to business model innovation, and they're creating new lines of business inside the company. And they're creating shareholder value and new growth areas. One company that is breaking out is addressing the um, challenge of Parkinson's. Now, for those of you who know, Parkinson's is a neurological disorder that um, affects one million Americans. Every year, um, 60,000 new cases are diagnosed. Parkinson's has touch many families, and I think many of you probably know someone or know of someone that knows someone that has had Parkinson's. I myself lost my cousin to Parkinson's a few years ago, and three weeks ago I lost a very good friend, very young. Medtronic is one of these companies breaking out and addressing Parkinson's head on. Uh, they're one of the largest device manufacturers in the world, and we've had the pleasure of working with them partnering with them for the past few years to come up with a specific solution addressing Parkinson's. Let's watch. My experience with Parkinson's is it's a living death. It's a living death because you're still living, but you're watching things die off. You know, I had to give up my job. That's something that died off. I loved being a high school administrator. I loved being an educator. Before I had deep brain stimulation surgery, my hand would be rigid and my fingers were like a claw, I used to call them. Um, and I used to shuffle a lot. Uh, 
I'm so glad that I did it because I don't have the trimmer in my right hand. It just improved my quality of life. Deep brain stimulation surgery has given me my life back. I can do things that I wouldn't be able to do if I didn't have it. Please welcome Vice President of Enterprise Sales, Mobile B2B Samsung Electronics America, John Curtis, and Medtronic's Vice President of Strategy, Technology and Business Development, Earl Slee. Hello everyone and, uh, and thank you. I think first of all, I would just like to say that I'm delighted to announce the launch today of the Samsung Patient Programmer in conjunction with Medtronic for deep brain stimulation. So Earl, welcome to SDC. Thank you, John, and, and on behalf of Medtronic, we are very happy to uh, partner with you in the launch today. The press release went out earlier today, and I'd like to share with the audience that the very first Medtronic Sam Samsung Patient Programmer handset was delivered to the lady you just saw on the stage, Susan. <laughs> Susan, thank you for sharing your story with us. So, Earl, maybe you could tell us a bit more about Medtronic. What is your history? What is your mission? Sure, uh, that's great. Well, first of all, it, John, it, it, it it begins and ends with, with the patients, always. Uh, you know, part of our, our mission statement is to alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. And we can do that on a, on a large number of conditions. We, Medtronic treats over 70 conditions in the body. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, surgical, and brain therapies like the deep brain stimulation technology that you just saw. We're a very large company, John. We, we, we're over 30 billion. We have 90,000 employees all over the world. We sell in more than 160 countries around the world. But Medtronic was started 70 years ago by an entrepreneur in collaboration with a physician at a local hospital. And that collaboration history extends to today where we deeply uh, cherish that history of partnership and, and we're pleased to be here with uh, uh, John, with you and to here today and, this, and to extend this journey, this collaboration. Excellent. So, so I think it's, it's fair to say that the word innovation is absolutely synonymous with, uh, with Medtronic. But Tahir was just talking about breakout innovation and disrupting in the market. What's Medtronic's perspective on that and how, how, how specifically are you doing it? Great, that's a great question, John. We're, we're very focused on, on bringing new therapies to market. Uh, we start with unmet clinical needs, and I can give you a couple examples. Uh, for example, in our neurovascular division, we innovated a, a stent-like device that's used for a condition called acute ischemic stroke. This is where a clot suddenly leaves and enters the neck and, and the brain, and you have a sudden deficit that, that you have as a result of that. So we innovated a, a device called Solitaire that you insert in an artery in the leg, run up the aorta, up the carotids, and into the brain. You grab that clot and you pull it out. And, and that therapy was, uh, was a game changer. It was disruptive. It set a new standard of care. Uh, secondly, um, in our cardiovascular group, uh, Medtronic was started, uh, invented one of the first battery-powered uh, pacemakers. And a pacemaker looks like this. It's a can with a battery and, and microelectronics. It's, it's mounted in the pectoral region of the chest, and you run a lead down to the heart, and you deliver electrical stimulation. And that, and that sets right the, the cadence of the heart, the beating of the heart. Um, Medtronic has today shrunk this down by about 20 or 30 fold, and now you implant a very small device in, actually in the chamber of the heart. Uh, lastly, again, focusing on uh, Susan, our patient here, in the deep brain stimulation, realm. Uh, we have a similar device, a CAN, microelectronics battery, run the lead up into the brain, and we place an electrical wire very precisely in the, a location in the brain where we can disrupt the abnormal electrical activity 
that can reduce that tremor and improve the patient's gait. Um, we're not stopping there. We had the launch last year of the, the Samsung tablet for our clinician programmer. This year that we just announced, just today, the, the patient programmer. But we're going beyond that. Rather than just stimulating the brain, we're also going to start sensing biomarkers in the brain. So not yet, but in the future, a couple years down the road, we're going to be able to sense when her symptoms or a patient's symptoms are starting to increase. We can increase stimulation. The symptoms go down. We decrease stimulation. And so this will be an adaptive uh, algorithm that we're working on that will come out in a few more years. Excellent. So, so the conference over uh, the last day and today is very much about 5G, AI, IoT. So what's, what's Medtronic's perspective on how those technologies are, uh, are changing healthcare? Uh, that, great question, John. And it's, a, it's huge. And we need all of that. Uh, I think probably the developers in the room are way ahead of us. But in terms of you know, planning surgeries like DBS, we need to download huge data file images of the brain. You, know, you have an, a CT, an MR of the brain that looks at the anatomical uh, uh, images, the vascular images, the, the brain fiber track images. We need to bring them all together using 5G and merge those so we can plan a surgery and help the physician get precisely where they need to get. Uh, in terms of Internet of Things, our devices are implantable. They really are becoming part of the Internet of Things. Not today yet. We need to work on that connectivity with partners like Samsung to, to improve that and enable and un unlock future uh, possibilities. And then with artificial intelligence, that's, that's a future as well for us because as we download, as we can sense in the brain and download that biomarker information, we can crowdsource that and collect you know, thousands of patient years of data and then help the physician optimize that specific patient much more quickly. Excellent. So, so we have a room here full of developers who want to make a difference as well and are looking to engage with Samsung. We've been working together now for roughly about 10 years. Mm -hmm. What's the, the one piece of advice you'd give to everyone in the room for engaging with Samsung from a development perspective? Sure, absolutely. And uh, you have to remember uh, this is an important partnership for Medtronic because when we implant our device and our lead, it disappears from view, right? Which is good. That's a good thing. That's what it's supposed to do. Um, but what the patient and the customer sees is the tablet and the handset. So we, well, first of all, what we need is a very strong partner with, with a terrific brand reputation, with a terrific user interface, um, with good security because security is very important to us. Uh, so because really that Samsung device is representing the state-of-the-art technology that you no longer see that's inside. So, so we, we, we cherish that, that part of it. The, the other things that are important to us is a partner that, that is willing to go the mile with us. And what we found in, in John and yourself and Tahir and others is that willingness to say, hey, we don't have it all figured out we're willing to brainstorm with you and, and partner. Because when it comes down to it, it's really all about the patients. And, and that's we're all trying to do the same thing to help <clears throat> and make these devices simpler, easier, better, faster uh, to use. Earl, thank you so much. And for everyone in the audience, um, please do consider joining Earl and Susan Mollahan um, during their breakout session this afternoon. It's 2.30 in uh, room 211B. But Earl, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely, thank, thank you. you. Really inspiring, really moving. Susan, thank you so much for being here. It really means a lot to us. Um, this is the example of meaningful impact that we make with our partners in the industry. This is actually what drives us every day. I was just standing in the back. One of the staff told me, I wish I'd known about this. I have a friend who could benefit from this. So this is what happens every single day to us. Um, we work with a number of different companies. Number of different companies that break out. Inside these companies, we have champions who drive this innovation and champions who sponsor Samsung to work with them. 
And we, when we partner with them, we ask them, what can we do to help you more successful? What can we do as Samsung to drive the business forward? And this is what they tell us. They say, <clears throat> look, we partner with us, so help us so we can get our products to the market uh, more quickly. These products, these solutions, these are complex. They tell us that, um, they tell us that uh, developers are hard to find. They tell us that uh, they can't find enough resources. They also tell us that the systems they use are too complex and they are uh, complicated. So they're asking Samsung to simplify it. Very importantly, they also tell us security is a big problem and remains a big problem. In fact, Verizon had done a survey and it turned out <clears throat> the results were interesting because 33% of companies say they've suffered some type of a security event because of their mobile devices. 67% say they don't feel um, that they have done enough on mobile security. And almost 50% say, look, I'm just trying to get the job done. These are really scary statistics. And this is why companies are looking at Samsung to provide the most flexible, easy to use products, but also the most secure products. We also work with you, with developers, with partners in the industry. We know that app developers are the creative brain that drive and generate energy for the B2B marketplace. That's why we are here today working together. And we also ask you, how can we help you? How can we move your business forward? And this is what we hear. Developers are telling us that, look, um, I need to be able to customize the hardware and software. I need to design the product as though I designed the whole thing myself from scratch. They're telling us that uh, I need specific products for the application that I'm working on. They're telling us, don't give me a consumer product to run a B2B application and use case. They are telling us, uh, I'm designing apps, but I don't understand the exact requirements of a certain vertical or a certain business. I'm kind of disconnected from the requirement. And finally, they say, <clears throat> when I have developed the app, how do I take this app to the marketplace? How do I scale it? How do I access the other Samsung uh, customers that could benefit from this? To understand this a bit more, we actually looked at more data and a comprehensive study that Accenture had done. Two main points stood out. Almost half say pretty much all the platforms that developers use out, out there are the same, plus or minus, they're the same. But 70% of developers of you said, if you give me something that's differentiated, I'll use it. In fact, I'll switch to it. And when we asked more and looked at the data, this is the, this is, these are the main drivers for this, this mindset. One is the platform must focus on the latest technology. All these things that I talked about earlier, devices, networks, new applications. It should support all of them. Two, it must be future looking, future proof. Third, it must be easier to use. And of course, finally, um, I have to be able to improve my career, be successful, make money out of it. That's what you developers are looking for. So when we put together the input, sort of the, the, the advice that we get from our, our customers, both large enterprise on one side and then our developers, uh, we see that there's a gap and we need to connect this gap together to make this market explode and grow even further. And in fact, we put a number in this gap. It turns out that if we manage to bring developers and enterprises together and put them together effectively, we can create $75 billion of shareholder value in the US. $75 billion is a lot of money. That's three or four different unicorns going public every year in the US. So the question is, um, how do we do this? How is Samsung responding? Well, it all starts with our innovative product set, our special purpose devices, and our display technology. Let me 
ask my colleague Suala Nunez to come and describe these emerging trends. Good morning, I'm Swale, and I head up Samsung developer B2B developer relations. But first, uh, let's talk about our devices built for industry. Our smartphones, tablets, and wearables are the most innovative purpose-built devices in the marketplace. It is the same purpose-built approach that speaks to us as enterprise developers. As B2B developers, we create applications for use as work tools. Our apps are designed for a unique set of business requirements. The hardware that runs these apps must complement that level of specification. To that end, this week we announced a new rugged smartphone, the Samsung Galaxy X-Cover Field Pro. It's built to withstand the harshest conditions, from drops and shocks to extreme temperatures. As developers, we strive to create a code that don't break. With the X-Cover Field Pro, Samsung has delivered a device as tough as our code. We built in a dedicated push to talk button and open APIs to make it programmable. So it just doesn't do what we want it to do, it does what you need it to do. Whether it's repurposed to send alerts and location data, this level of customization is ideal for developers working with first responders, emergency management professionals, and other industrial applications. Our commitment to first responders goes beyond this device. Yesterday, we announced a new joint platform platform leveraging IBM Cloud, AI capabilities, and Samsung's mobile offerings. Built on the IBM Cloud, the new platform will now allow clients to track officer vitals to determine if that person is in distress and automatically dispatch help. Now let's talk about tablets. Yesterday, we now... Yesterday, we announced a new joint platform leveraging IBM Cloud and AI capabilities and Samsung's mobile offerings. Built on the IBM Cloud, the new platform will now allow clients to track officer vitals to determine if the person is in distress and automatically dispatch help. Now let's talk about our tablets. As Tahir mentioned, our demand in this category has doubled in the last year. According to a recent Forbes study, employees who use smartphones or tablets save an average of an hour a day and that increases productivity by 34%. Our manufacturing, logistics, and field service customers need a ruggedized tablet to extend these efficiency gains to the harsh environments they operate in. So today, in the tradition of Samsung innovation, I am proud to launch, in the US, our Galaxy Tab Active Pro. Let's take a look. As you can see, the Tab Active Pro is an impressive ruggedized device. But with Samsung, it's not just about the hardware, it's also about the software that sits on top of it. Together, they combine to give enterprise developers the tooling they need to innovate. For the first time, the Tab Active Pro includes Samsung DeX, which enables an immersive PC-like experience. With DeX, Tab Active Pro can give, give you the ability to work anywhere, use it with your mobile apps in the field, on the factory floor, and then easily transition to the office environment with Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop. Tab Active Pro is also mobile POS ready, allowing you to easily integrate payment and inventory management features within your app. 
This improved the user experience with seamless transactions in the harshest of environments. This makes Tab Active Pro an excellent device for developers building apps for mobile food vendors, delivery and logistics companies, and industrial service providers. At 10.1 inches, the new Tab Active Pro is the largest ruggedized tablet on the market. Its touchscreen has been enhanced to use anywhere. Rain, snow, mud falls right off. You can actually use it with a glove on. All these features speak to the purpose-built purpose design of the Tab Active Pro. Samsung also produces flagship devices that professionals really love. From the boardroom to the frontline customer service reps to the entrepreneurs, our devices inspire. We provide developers with a variety of form factors to get your apps in the hands of the business users who need them. Whether it's support for next-gen networks to hear mention, depth sensing cameras, or designing for foldable technology, our flagship devices provide new avenues to innovate. Samsung also leads the commercial display market with more than 25% of global market share. In businesses, restaurants, and retail stores, our video walls, commercial displays, and flip interactive whiteboards transform the way customers view your business. With our smart signage platform, powered by Tizen, developers can, are ab is able to extend their in-app experience from our mobile devices to our larger displays. These are our enterprise devices. To realize th their full potential, we need you to develop powerful applications that run on them. As a develop developer, I understand your challenges. I'm committed to providing you with the support you need to deliver. You have a voice. With that, I welcome back to here, back to the stage. So the Samsung Mobility Platform, platform. Devices are the foundation of this platform. Now I want you to take a look at this image because this is what we call a platform. Device, OS, software, configuration, and there's more. This is the common language of discussion between us. It's the common architecture that we will refer to, and it starts with devices. Now, as Swale just mentioned, our devices are very unique. They're the most innovative in the marketplace. They have features that we can touch and experience, like the S Pen, the camera, the screen. And they have features and functions which are embedded. AI, blockchain, and the most advanced communication modules for the most advanced networks. The second layer is OS. So we use our devices, our mobile devices and tablets use Android. Android is widely adopted. It's good for the developers. It provides high ROI with low investment. It's easy to use. And it has low barrier of entry for developers. We also use Tizen. Tizen is used to control wearables, uh, displays, and appliances. So when you combine Android and Tizen, you get the most widely adopted and the largest number of endpoints in the industry today of any vendor, of any player in the marketplace. Tizen plus Android, Android plus Tizen. And we make Android plus Tizen open, but we also make it secure. How do we make it secure? We do that with Knox. So many of you have heard about Knox throughout the years. But what is Knox? Knox is Samsung's unique solution. It controls and manages all the layers of our platform, from the hardware all the way up to the user interface. How does it work? Well, if you're an enterprise, you have easy to use tools. You can manage the mobile device 
to what we call the mobile journey or the product life cycle management of that device inside an enterprise. From the time the device is activated and deployed, Knox provides management, configuration, and keeps all of the software up to date. But Knox isn't just for the enterprise, it's also for the developer, for you. So Knox enables us to access all the different features and all the layers of the hardware of the device. Swale just talked about that. A deep level of customization and integration. So we, you can develop applications around the specific features of a specific device as though you designed it in the way you wanted it to be designed. For example, everything on the device, on the Samsung device, the button, the S Pen, the camera, display, these can all be customized for certain applications. So how do we start? Well, Knox has a certain number of APIs that gives control to the uh, basic features of OS, but also beyond what Android provides to you. So you can design the device flexibly in the way you want it to be designed. We do not have this option with all of the Android options out there, and you certainly don't have this option with the closed ecosystem. There is no need to jailbreak. There is no need to void the warranty of a device because you want to do something special around it. No other mobile platform combines the flexibility of Knox with the security that we provide in the marketplace. On the device side, when you add hardware, OS, and Knox, I just want to tell you that we are the leading edge in the marketplace. Everyone else is just trying to catch up. Now, we're giving more option to our developers with Knox. Today, uh, we are announcing the, the updated Knox Partners uh, program. We're trying to make life easier for our ecosystem partners. And this is an a, a upgraded, new, enhanced program that we're putting in the marketplace. We provide developers access to test devices. We provide unlimited keys, developer keys. We provide Knox validated uh, validation processes for the apps that you develop and managers that can help you and hold your hand as you develop these products on a global basis. And for apps that are develop, developed on Knox, we'll also promote these by Samsung. So when we combine all of this together, Knox and our mobility platform, the message we want to convey to you is you can innovate with peace of mind. And what we say is go ahead, innovate, innovate without having fear. And to show you an example of how this is done, let me uh, ask a colleague of mine, Sandra Kreef and um, Roseanne Sakoni to come from Blue Jeans to describe this in more detail. Please welcome. Roseanne, thank you for being here and welcome. Hello, everybody. I am so excited to share with all of you what we've built in partnership with Verizon, BlueJeans, and Samsung. This is the perfect example of a third-party application leveraging the power of the Knox Suite to go deep inside the mobile platform and leverage some key Samsung mobile capabilities to better the end-user experience. But before we show you, Roseanne, can you tell us a little bit about who's Blue Jeans? Absolutely. And by the way, thank you so much for having us here. We're so excited to be here, especially uh, around the developers, because we know how important this community is for the next series of innovation and video. So Blue Jeans Network is an enterprise video conferencing meetings company uh, where our platform is focused on the most uh, in innovative, an immersive video experience for meetings on the planet. You know, whether that's in a mob on a mobile device, whether you're in a cafe, whether you're in a conference room, whether you're working from home, to make that experience as seamless as possible for our end users. 
um, that's really our passion and mission in life. Well, thank you. I actually really love your product. I use it every day for my team calls, for my one-on-one. -on -one. I use the video and it's so easy to use and it always works. So now let's get to the exciting part. Can you share with us what we've built together? Please? Absolutely, excited to do so. And before I show you the first video, I'm gonna give you guys some context. So as many of you guys know, I think more than 30% of meetings, video meetings are done on mobile devices. So you know how busy we all are, getting from meeting to meeting and place to place. And so you're gonna be yes. maybe in your car, you're on a, a, a mobile device, you're in a meeting, and you go into your office and you go into a conference room and you're trying to figure out, well, how do I get and keep on this meeting? And I want that seamless experience in the meeting, right? And what we've developed together, leveraging the APIs, is a way to leverage the camera capabilities on the mobile device to really make a seamless experience from the mobile into the conference room. So let me show you an example of just how simple and easy that is. So here you're gonna see the, the deck station. You just plug in the Samsung pen phone, and there you are, you're in a meeting. Super simple, you don't have to worry about connecting anything in, and that content in that meeting, which you're trying to explain with a, your colleagues in your meeting, is in un, uninterrupted, which is really important. Yes, that is But you great. know, Sandra, so how many people do you think are in this meeting? Looks like there's two people. Well, here's the thing, because we were able to take the APIs and really control the camera, we were able to use that wide angle camera capability to really showcase how many people are really in this conference room. So this will show that. So you can see you have a full sort of display and who's in the meeting. Everybody can engage seamlessly and all you're really That's doing great. is leveraging the power of this camera. So you're basically telling me I have a video conference solution in my pocket. Absolutely. That's cool. And That's these kinds of devices, they should be easy, seamless, and cost effective. You shouldn't need a lot of old legacy equipment in order to have this next generation experience. What else did we create together? Another thing we did leveraging the APIs, which is really cool. So if you look at the background here, there isn't anything on the whiteboard. But if you think about it, um, there could be sensitive information on that whiteboard. Or let's say you're in a Starbucks having a meeting, and there's a lot of visual background noise, right? So we created a privacy setting or a blurring setting, and the idea is to take the, the background noise, visual noise, out of the way, and so you could really just engage with the person in the meeting. So you're gonna see the blurring in this next video. So you can see oh, that yeah. blurring in the background, and then you'll see it unblur, and you can see that can be pretty distracting in a meeting. So, so situationally, the user can control. You know, when do they wanna show blurring and when do they don't, so pretty cool. This is perfect because I sometimes work from home and my kids tend to barge into my office all the time. So privacy mode. Absolutely. Thank you. So how do we actually control now the meeting room because it's all driven through the phone? Such a great uh, question. And you know, another API we could leverage is in the, um, the S Pen. Oh, nice. So wouldn't you guys love to be able to control you know, your meetings? and mute on and off without searching for the button on the table. We've all been there, right? So what we did is we leveraged the pen and made that really the control point for the room. And what you'll hear, see here is a person is just, you know, sitting here, clicking on their pen to mute and unmute their meeting. And the vision here is really to make that meeting's experience as seamless and immersive as possible. And the form factors, the complexity of the form factors just merge in the background. That's great, so thank you. Uh, so just a moment ago, Swali announced the sale of the Tab Active Pro device in the US. Uh, how do you see devices like this create new capabilities for Blue Jeans? Well, one of the things that's really exciting about these ruggedized devices is you could really purpose build for video situations to really cover a needs in business across so many different industries. And let me give you guys all an example. And we have all been there. You're on an airplane, you get on the plane, and there's a delay. And let's say there's a mechanic delay or some sort of delay. Yeah. Well, part of the reason it's such a long delay time is because the ground crew and the flight crew, they have to coordinate information. And so you see people running up and down the stairs trying to get all of that maintenance use case defined. Now, with a ruggedized device combined with video, you could have a high-quality, fine-grained experience where you could have the ground crew and the flight crew communicating, showcasing the issue, 
they have now a round trip uh, audit trail visually of what was done. And so you can turn around those operational airplanes very, very quickly relative to the delays we see today. Perfect. I mean, we travel so much, no need for more delays. Yeah, that's really great. So shifting gears a little bit, uh, the networks are evolving. Uh, today, the Samsung mobile device supports Wi-Fi 6 as well as 5G. How do you see this network evolution creating a new experience for the end user and how they use the applications? It's a great question because we really think about the mobile experience, the 5G network, and video. And when you think about video, what you want is high bandwidth throughput on your video in, in super high quality on your video, regardless of where you are. And what the 5G networks enable is that high bandwidth consistency. So you can develop with confidence that your need for a fine-grained use case across, mm -hmm. it could be a telemedicine use case, it could be fleet maintenance use cases. I mean, there's tons of industrial class use cases where video and the use case for video on mobile devices in a 5G network where you need that consistency of bandwidth all come together in a really cool way. And I like to say, if you can imagine it as a developer, you're gonna have the tools to be able to create that, and that's really cool. That's great, thank you. So today we're at the developers conference with our developer friends, and Samsung's a big company, actually a huge company, and I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, how easy was it to work with Samsung? Can you share your experience? Uh, sure. So, you know, Blue Jeans is a mid sized company, right? Yeah. But what we look for and what we're passionate about in our labs and with our developers is innovation, really important to us. And we really believe in open API environments. The ecosystems around us are really important for innovation. And what we loved about the partnership, you know, with Samsung is we were able to leverage APIs really easily. We got prototypes up and running in weeks. And then there was a whole expert set of engineers at Samsung who worked with us so quickly if we had questions. So this whole collaborative process of development and leveraging the APIs was really seamless. And you don't get that in a lot of big companies. So we were really excited about this ability to innovate together. Well, wow. In weeks, we got a prototype ready. That's really impressive. Well, thank you, Roseanne. This was so much fun. And for everybody, please visit us at the Enterprise Workstation to get a live demo. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all very much. Uh, I have an announcement to make. I regret to inform you I just fired that clown. <laughs> we'll have more next year. So. What you just heard is actually very interesting. Here's Blue Jeans that took our device, used all the aspects of the device to come up with a really interesting solution. And not only just for one application or vertical, but for many different verticals. So the question is for us and for companies like Blue Jeans and for you as developers, how do we take these product and make sure we reach the Samsung installed base? Different verticals, different applications. On the other side, how does a business owner, a large or small business, actually find these really cool applications? This is an important point for us. So with that in mind, we go back to our mobility platform, and now we add a new layer, but a very important layer to it. And for now, we begin to call this App Stack. So App Stack, is a B2B specific app delivery mechanism. App delivery mechanism for SaaS or native apps designed around Samsung. App Stack enables the intelligent discovery and recommendation of apps to a business, to a vertical. It also enables the purchase or subscription of apps buy a business and direct delivery of these apps to a Samsung device. Here's how it works. If I'm a new Samsung user, the first time I'm buying my device as a business owner, 
I select the device, I select the apps that I need to run my business, I bundle these, I purchase them, and then the apps are delivered directly to my device or devices at the time of activation. If I am a existing user, existing business, I get very specific recommendations around my business based on the vertical, based on the size of my business and some patterns and use cases. If I choose these apps, if I select them at my discretion, they are then da downloaded directly to my device or devices, either directly or through the MDM. Now remember, as an app, as a business owner, I choose the app at my discretion. There is no bloatware, there is no clutter. And this is how it looks on a device. On Samsung devices, this is very manageable, very easy, because the personal apps are kept on one side. For those of you who haven't seen it, you should see it. And the business apps are kept in a different side, all on the same device, very easily accessible. Easy to manage, easy to find, no clutter. So with this layer, this additional layer to our mobility platform, which we call App Stack, we are changing the paradigm for B2B. We need to change this because we need the market to grow for all of us and we can benefit from this ecosystem. Enterprises, SMBs can discover, purchase, subscribe apps that they need when they need them. We've seen many applications today. Developers, you and our partners, can reach Samsung installed base and leverage our marketing power in the marketplace. For a select number of partners and enterprises, we will provide customer support to deploy, deploy apps in an enterprise. So why are we positioned to do this and why are we doing it now? Remember, we are a major player in the B2B market. We have one billion B2B devices installed in the market today. In the United States, we have 100 million devices that are used by B2B players. And we add 12 million devices every year in the US alone. So we have the scale to drive the market for the benefit of the entire ecosystem. Now, to jumpstart, to supercharge this initiative, we're also adding what we call a B2B community. It's the first of its kind in the marketplace. Think of this as a next-gen forum, as a place you can exchange ideas and learn, but also to identify and, and, and look for peer-to-peer -peer partnerships and what I call distributed collaboration. Because remember, Many of these solutions that we showed you today are complex. No one company can do it alone. And what we want to do is bring companies that have different expertise and different platforms, bring them together. And they could be by different vendors. This is the only way that we can help our enterprises, the ones who want to break out, accelerate their time to market, lower their cost of uh, development, and bring the right talent to make all of this happen. At the end, we believe this community will enable our enterprises to make a decision. Do they build it in-house? Do they partner or do they buy it? But that's exactly the kind of conversation we want to happen. So what's next? We, Samsung B2B, uh, are committed to implementing this new platform because it's good for the industry, it's good for all of us, for the ecosystem. We have mobilized expert team internally. The project has already started. We are leveraging all of the learnings of the past from all of the different projects we've had within Samsung. And we're building a backend with very intelligent analytics and, and app activation mechanisms to drive app stack forward. But we're also partnering with industry partners 
Many of them mentioned here today, Microsoft yesterday, VMware, and others. But we, and we request and we invite your partnership. ISVs, app developers, SaaS companies. So to do this, we are starting a series of what we call design thinking initiatives. We're not going to deliver something to you and say take it or leave it. We want your partnership as we design this going forward. This is an open collaboration between all of us. The result of these thinking workshops will then drive and finalize the requirements and the for the implementation of what we call app stack. In addition to this, we are investing in our own developer community. Earlier in the year, we began a series of hackathons with MIT. We just had our 5G hackathon with Verizon running on a live 5G network. We'll have a series of these coming up. There's one coming up in Austin, another one in Seattle, and more in different cities in the country. Whatever app we develop in these events will feature in AppStack. Let's start our collaboration. There's a lot of upside in this for all of us. I showed you some numbers earlier. B2B is growing, the market size is big. This is a $75 billion potential opportunity for all of us. Please sign up, engage with us, collaborate with us. So let me wrap up. I hope that you first and foremost recognize something about Samsung B2B, our size, our market presence, and what we do in the marketplace. I hope that you now recognize what we call our mobility platform, the way we approach the market in a very systematic, organized manner, and how we are committed to, to drive this market forward. We are in this to make everyone successful, or the entire ecosystem, SMBs, enterprises, our partners, our carriers. But I always go back to what I started. It's not about just a product, and it's not about the platform. It's about the people that make this all this happen. It's about people that drive innovation and defy the barriers. It's really a pleasure to meet you today, and thank you for your time. Please welcome back Lori Fraley. Thank you so much to Hair, John, Earl, Swale, Sandra, and Roseanne. That was so inspiring. I'm excited about how vast the opportunities are for developers to drive impact and change in the enterprise space around the world. You can create apps for Samsung's massive portfolio on new customizable products like XCover Field Pro, Tab Active Pro, and our wildly popular flagship devices. And with the Knox Partner Program, Project App Stack, and the B2B community, you will get all the support you need to make your inspiration a reality. And now to switch gears a bit. We have here today, and I'm not exaggerating, a true rock star in cryptocurrency, Vitalik Buterin, one of the co-founders of Ethereum. He and John Jun, known as JJ, Director of Content and Services for Samsung Electronics, will now chat about how blockchain will impact developing for mobile. Welcome Vitalik and John. All right, good morning. Good morning, everyone. All right, uh, hopefully uh, you guys have a great time here uh, at Samsung Develops Conference. Uh, this is my ple uh, great pleasure to have a Vitalik Buterin uh, here at Samsung uh, Develops Conference, uh, especially uh, uh, this lovely morning. So, good morning, Vitalik. Good morning. So, yeah, I'm doing well. All right, so I believe this is your first time at Samsung Develops it Conference. Is, yeah. So, how you feel? What's your first impression? Especially, more importantly, to be with the great world-class level of developers here. Yay, developers. Yay, first clap. <laughs> you know, it, look, it, you know, it looks like a nice event. I mean, good to see so many people here. Yeah. All right, okay. Yeah, yeah so, um, I mean, this is our actually first time to actually uh, to cover uh, Samsung blockchain uh, with Vitalik. Uh, so uh, hopefully, uh, I mean, we are expecting to hear from your uh, experience and mm -hmm. your insight as well. Mm -hmm. So we actually have uh, a few questions that we prepared with Vitalik before. 
So we're going to actually share those. Uh, um, so as having said that, I just want to ask you some first question as how did you come up with the, uh, your idea of uh, Ethereum uh, to begin with? Uh, so I was working on a Bitcoin uh, project for about two years before that. So I started with uh, Bitcoin Magazine and then I started kind of branching out and looking into some projects that were being built on top of Bitcoin, like Covered Coins and Mastercoin were two of the kind of bigger ones. And I started working with these projects more and more and I was realizing that there were a lot more and more people thinking about of how to use blockchains, the technology behind Bitcoin, and apply them to more kinds of applications. And people are looking at this for a domain registration, for uh, issuing new kinds of digital assets, trading between digital assets, like recording information on the chain, like lots of different things. Um, and I started thinking about how to try to make this more general purpose and the kind of natural idea for how to make a blockchain more general purpose, which is basically to kind of stick a programming language inside of it, kind of came fairly quickly after that, and um, Ethereum started from there. So can I say maybe that you're, uh, one of your smart contract idea is for the general purpose yeah. in a way? Yeah. Gotcha, awesome. So I'm pretty sure you uh, have like a lot of challenges, mm -hmm. right? So what were those and how did you um, overcome with those uh, challenges? I think the biggest challenges weren't the technical challenges, they were more the social challenges. So the Ethereum project started with many co-founders, and so there were about like eight co-founders there from the beginning. There was a large team, it grew quickly. Um, it was, a, at the time I had no idea how to even create a founding team. Okay. Um, and uh, it was just like pretty much everyone who wanted to join kind of joined at the beginning. And like it, it, over the course of a year, it kind of became clear that there were a lot of different people that had like, different visions, different values. Some people wanted to do for-profit things. Some people wanted to um, be, uh, take Ethereum into a kind of crypto Google direction. There, some people just wanted to make as much money as they could out of it. And there were a lot of, diff right, of different directions people were pulling and a lot of people just ended up uh, leaving. Okay. And I mean, the project is in a much better place now, but it definitely kind of took uh, m multiple rounds of kind of very challenging situations to get where we are now. Okay, so it sounds like a, a more like a people management, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay. like blockchains and cryptocurrencies are kind of even more about the people than they are about the technology. Okay, so but did you have some experience people not really understanding uh, within your philosophy about your mm -hmm. vision? Definitely. Like that? Yeah. That's almost one of the, your challenges as well. Yeah. So. Okay, that's great. Um, so let's talk about the Ethereum a little bit more. So um, how can Ethereum can help or contribute to developers here continue to work on mobile? And so I think in blockchain applications, I guess first of all are something that's you know, starting to be built and, start, and uh, starting to be used on kind of mobile phones more and more. Like we see just cryptocurrency wallets and you see it, applications for and doing different kinds of things in person. And, and so there is already a lot of development around kind of blockchain-based mobile applications, but um, blockchain projects themselves can definitely do a lot of things to make themselves more friendly to mobile development. So like for example, including light client support so you can run a node without um, having to have a, a fairly powerful computer is uh, something that's very important, it's something that the Ethereum community is working on quite a lot. Um, and, and also just kind of the functionality that blockchains provide around kind of being able to issue tokens, uh, being able to kind of store information between like, many different participants, like, you know, decentralized identity applications and all of these things could be quite valuable to many application developers. So do you believe uh, the mobile, uh, I mean, compared to mobile and just PC industry, do you think that mobile is going to be more central, it's going to play a more central role in the blockchain overall? I think they're both very important. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, all right. So, I mean, um, this is actually great to hear. So, how do you envision between Samsung Mobile mm -hmm. and Ethereum can actually contribute to uh, expand the uh, mobile blockchain ecosystem? Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, Samsung has been doing a lot of good work recently in uh, integrating support for Ethereum applications, like into their phones, for example, and I saw the uh, announcement about an SDK um, came out a couple of days. So, and I think that's really good. And I think 
a big advantage Samsung has is just its ability to reach you know, very large groups of people kind of fairly quickly, and so you could use that to get blockchain applications out to people. You would also kind of are on the front lines in terms of the things like user experience issues, and that's something that the blockchain community definitely needs to kind of experiment and iterate on a, a few times and kind of generally help to solve kind of the challenges and taking the industry to the next stage and getting mass adoption. Okay, all right. So I mean, this is what we are exactly looking at right now. The one of the main reasons we released Samsung Key Store mm -hmm. is because we actually understand the importance about the, uh, the private key in mm -hmm. the blockchain yeah. concept in there. So um, I know this is kind of baby step for us right now, but there is definitely a big strategy for Samsung's perspective that we're gonna actually expand more usability and use cases with that one. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want you to kind of a little bit more elaborate, like mm -hmm. a, for example, uh, right now, the Samsung phone is providing SDK for developers can mm -hmm. use our block uh, 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 key store mm -hmm. uh, for them to keep the, their, their private key in here. Mm -hmm. But what else, uh, what kind of things we can actually work a little bit deeper? I mean, in terms of um, the hardware perspective, um, not really software, but like a, per, a hardware perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Do you see some value with the Samsung mobile phones? Yeah, so on the hardware side, I think some kind of secure hardware for handling private keys is going to be very important. And like, as hard as we try, kind of Android is still a kind of very complicated operating system with a lot of risk of like bug, bugs, backdoors, like what all of these different issues. And so having a kind of spe separate special space for kind of high security components is something that could really increase security a lot. And then you know, uh, kind of on the hardware and the software side, trying to kind of take cryptographic private keys and expand that out into a kind of security solution that's uh, user friendly is something I think is really important. Okay, so you know what, let me ask you one kind of challenge question here. Mm -hmm. I mean, he and I didn't discuss about this, but I got this question so many times. Mm -hmm. So what if, what if uh, someone actually losing their phone mm -hmm. with a private key in there? Yeah. Do you have any good idea how we can actually recover that? Yeah, so no, this is actually a topic I've uh, thought about quite a bit. Like in general, I think accounts that are secured by one private key on one device is just not the sort of model that you would want to kind of push to people as like this is the new, uh, the, the great new way of doing money, right? Because it's kind of worse than the old way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a couple of solutions. So one of the things that I've been kind of like, supporting pretty heavily recently is this idea of social recovery where you, you would have your funds, instead of being in an account controlled by one key, you would have them, have them inside of a smart contract. And that smart contract would have rules that say, like for example, you have one key, and, and you would also have, say, five other keys, and, you, and those five other keys would be controlled by, uh, could be your friends, could be institutions, could be family, could be your other device, like could be lots of different things. And you would need uh, out of any three of those five keys in order to kind of reset the main key on the account. And oh, wow. so yeah. like, if, you're, if your main key gets lost, then with three out of those five, you can recover it. If your key gets stolen, then with three out of those five, you can switch it and so forth. Okay, wow, yeah. okay. That is something we actually never thought about. This mm -hmm. is a brilliant idea. Yeah. So like, having multiple private keys, that's kind yeah, of exactly. concept of that one. Yeah, and it's, it's an approach that's definitely been uh, kind of getting more and more popular. Like there's uh, the smart, uh, Argent has this uh, kind of smart contract wallet, and I saw an article, there was another project you know, starting to do this recently. And I think like if, like you want to, uh, I guess, as Samsung, create a wallet with like these kinds of properties that could really kind of help bring a more secure user experience to lots of people. Okay, so it sounds like uh, we can actually sell more than one phone to one person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's um, great, okay. No, no, you want your Samsung folks to be even more even, even more popular so, ever, so everyone gets one, so everyone can help store each other's keys. Okay, yeah. All right. All right. All right, let me ask you the one more kind of challenge question as well. Because sure. these days, 5G, Mm -hmm. uh, and blockchain both are pretty disruptive technologies these days. Yes. It seems like a 5G is getting a lot of like, uh, tractions globally. So do you believe 5G can drive the adoption of blockchain overall? Yeah, and I think uh, like much faster internet connections are gonna be a huge boost to the uh, scalability of blockchains. And like, right now, there's a lot of, kind of research in blockchain scalability and trying to improve uh, transaction throughput. And it turns out that kind of limitations in computation, uh, you can actually kind of 
work around them in a lot of different ways. But limitations on data, that's kind of the ultimate frontier. That's kind of limiting how much you can do on, uh, on a blockchain, like how many transactions, what complexity you can process. And so if we can get just faster internet connections between nodes, then we can have blockchains that are much more scalable, can process much more activity, that can be much more reliable, handle and many more nodes and all of these other good things. So I think it, that could definitely be a big help. So 5G uh, definitely can actually ha uh, help scalability of, of blockchain adoption. Definitely. That's, that, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, you know what, I'm, I'm pretty sure you read, a, you read an article which just came out a couple, uh, a couple of days ago about uh -huh. uh, Chinese President Xi. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, he just mentioned about the value of blockchain and mm -hmm. then, wow, it was kind of like a, a viral. It's like a going like everybody's talking about right now. Mm -hmm. So where do you think a blockchain is going from your perspective next five years? I, mean, I think uh, in the blockchain space in general is, uh, I mean, it's definitely not one space, right? And there's kind of different sub-communities in it that are trying to, you know, Bless you. Uh, per, thank you, uh, pursue different directions. Like there's enterprise block and government blockchain, there's the you know, decentralized finance movement, there's blockchains for identity, there's public blockchains, cryptocurrencies, you know, private chains and all of these different things. And in general, kind of when big institutional actors talk about blockchains, so like whether it's the Chinese government or like even just big corp other governments or big corporations, like for the last five years and, and even still now, like they tend to focus on kind of private and consortium uh, blockchain uh, setups. And then if my opinion on those is that I'm not especially kind of bullish on them, basically because I think like those kinds of blockchains are going to, or it's very hard to make them uh, kind of actually decentralized enough that people will trust them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we've been seeing like thing, even things like Libra, for example, things like a, a lot of, uh, of consortium chain uh, movements, even uh, some of the older ones, like they all seem to kind of run into this whole uh, uh, kind of wall that it seems like if you have 50 nodes instead of one, people should trust you, but it's like actually, doesn't give as much ben uh, as much benefit in that regard as people think. Okay. And so okay. I think in the long term, like public blockchains are going to be more successful. But I think like the facts that we have and you know, like inst powerful institutional actors just even saying things about blockchains in general, like I mean, it sets the stage for all of these for all of these things, right? It sets the stage for experimentation and enterprise. It sets the stage for and you know, people trying to do things in finance, trying to do things with identity. And like, it does kind of help create space for people to try to build lots of different, lots of different, different things in all of these different areas, even if they're kind of pretty far away from like the, uh, what whoever kind of said the word first had in mind. And I think like, in the long term, that's uh, an, it's something that can help kind of move the whole space forward. Got it, okay. So um, right now I'm, I'm Everybody's kind of worrying about the regulations right now. Yes. So like a, not only a United States, China, but many, many other countries seem to put some like a more mm -hmm. heavier restrictions on uh, blockchain usage right now. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that is the right way to do or this is too much? W what is thought about that one? It's some of both. <clears throat> I mean, there's definitely a kind of aspects of existing blockchain applications and the like ICOs are a big one, for example, that do have kind of very misaligned uh, incentives. And then I think like in the short term, like regulations can, can obviously kind of quickly uh, kind of reduce the, 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 like, those problems. But in the, at the same time, kind of in the long term, I think uh, like in that case specifically, like, what, what, what we would want is more kind of experimentation and different models on and like, different ways of launching projects that try to kind of solve those misalignments at a more core level. Mm -hmm. And, and then th there's also challenges around kind of how blockchain applications just interact with people who uh, are not uh, who are not using them and how they kind of interact with wider communities. So and I think it's definitely in inevitable for any kind of mainstream thing that some re that, that some regulation happens. Though at the same time, like it is definitely the sort of thing that's kind of very easy to just do in the uh, completely wrong way that just kind of entrenches a few uh, a few large actors in the space. And that's 
I mean, it's definitely something that we've seen uh, that we've seen in the yeah. U.S. in some cases. Absolutely. Like there's kind of states that advertise themselves as saying like, oh, we're blockchain friendly because we have the regulations, but actually that just kind of drives people away and, and more things happen in Asia okay. instead. So, you know, that's complicated. Got it, okay. All right, so I mean, uh, we talked to several industries right now. I mean, the, with the time, uh, interest of time. Mm -hmm. So what do you really hope, I mean, uh, for this audience to take one thing from our conversation today? So what do you think about that? I mean, I think, uh, first of all, like blockchains are, really starting to be close to being ready for a much wider scale uh, usage. And like many of the problems with uh, the blockchain space that like, I've been talking about for years, that the critics have been talking about for years, uh, are finally uh, kind of actually starting to be solved. So um, scalability, for example, like Bitcoin is limited to seven transactions a second, Ethereum to about 15 to 20. And that's been the fact for years. Mm -hmm. But now there's things like sharding, optimistic roll-up, all of these kind of layer one, layer two scaling buzzwords around the corner that have existed for, year, for years as ideas, but that are kind of much more and more starting to exist as things that you can download and use now. And I think we're just gonna kind of see even more of that happen over the next one to two years. And that's scaling, right? So then there's also privacy, and with privacy, zero knowledge proofs have just made huge progress in the last year, and we're gonna see more and more applications based on those. Security, and we talked already about smart contract wallets. Uh, usability, there's a lot of ways in which the developer experience is improving. So I think it really is looking like there is going to be a kind of new big wave of uh, blockchain app applications happening. And like this time it seems like it's not just going to be based on hype, it's going to be based on like things that actually touch a lot of people's lives and that should be really interesting. And I, I truly believe five G can actually help even more with yeah. that idea too, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, that's great. Um, so, I mean, we have a lot of de uh, developers out here mm -hmm. who are just starting out and working through their next big idea right now. Mm -hmm. So what is, the, what is your advice for those people? Uh, and I think go out and build something. And the nice thing about the Ethereum ecosystem is that there's a lot of developer materials, a lot of tutorials, a lot of things that you can just uh, like GitHub clone and then tweak a little bit. And it's not too hard to just start building simple Ethereum applications. So I'd, I'd recommend like anyone even, even if like just as a way of kind of learning like what the system feels like and how it works, just try building some like simple dumb smart contract application. It doesn't matter if it's a stupid idea that should never be used in the real world. Just build something just to kind of get the feel for like how to send a transaction, like what, uh, what it looks like to receive a transaction, how to interact with the chain, and kind of go from there. Yeah, sounds great, sounds great, okay. So, uh, so I have just one last question for you. Sure. How would you describe blockchain in one or two words? Decentralized computing. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Vitaly. I mean, this is great. I mean, um, I really enjoyed our conversation here. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I can see you uh, very near future. Yeah. With a better result. Uh, Definitely. So, all right. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. No, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vitalik and JJ. I'm really curious to see how developers will bring Ethereum and Samsung together on mobile apps. I'm astounded by how you, the developers, are the brain power that goes into building a community. We're not just talking about a place to get answers to tech questions. It's a community for spawning fresh new ideas where innovation is shared and built together hand in hand. The next experience that wows the world will probably come from the developer community. Do you know Melanie Lombardi from Echo Visuals? I can try to explain how her amazing stunning, mind-boggling things transform Samsung phones, but I'll let these images speak for themselves. Take a look. Truly fantastic. Can you believe that Melanie got started designing themes only four years ago when she got her first Samsung Galaxy S6 Edge? It seems like just yesterday. She was able to turn a fascinating side project into a successful income-generating business. They grew from a team of two to a team of seven. In fact, 
Echo Visuals is now one of Samsung's top revenue makers in the Galaxy Theme Store. But she didn't do it alone. Along with her family, Samsung's supportive e ecosystem, feedback from consumers, their own creative and designers and animators have all helped to propel her towards success. That's community. Echo Visuals and others have all helped mature and grow the Galaxy Theme Store, proving that what they do isn't just an art form that captures our hearts and minds, and enables our consumers to truly personalize their devices. Now let's take a look at Kamis Dimas, an award-winning Indonesian developer. Samsung honored him for his excellent camera app at the Best of Galaxy Store 2018 Awards. He said in his acceptance speech that he himself was inspired by an SDC 2017 session where both Melanie and Chris Shomo from Infinity Watch Faces shared their tips and tricks for working with Samsung. That hatched an idea that became Camus's winning app. To give you even more goosebumps, Chris was in the audience watching Camus accept his award last year. Chris said he was surprised and humbled to hear that he played a role in Camus's success. Each and every one of you have the potential to develop next year's award-winning apps and the potential to inspire yet another generation of technology. This is truly where now meets next. We think stronger together. We don't innovate in a bubble of isolation. We talked about phone themes and camera apps, but what about voice? It's a tremendously exciting frontier ripe for development. Daniel Mittendorf, a Bixby Premier developer from Germany, understood this and seized the moment. For Daniel, it's not about Gen Z, but Gen V for voice, because of how digital voice assistants will transform culture and society. He's working with Samsung's Bixby Marketplace to share DigiVoice capsules, which can do the most incredible things. And if you think using a Bixby capsule to order a ride to the airport is amazing, you ain't seen nothing yet. The Bixby team worked with Daniel to create capsules that let you launch a sound undetectable to human ears so that mosquitoes can't stand to keep those nasty bug bites at bay. It can also soothe and comfort your pets so that they won't freak you out when you leave them at home alone. I hate it when that happens. Life is stressful enough, but at least your dog can relax. We're here for you, whether it's for B2B or consumer facing, whether it's in voice or on screen. Together, we can support developer needs, find new ways to interface with users, and build community around the globe. Over the last two days, you've heard all about Samsung's latest hardware and software innovations. You've also heard stories from our partners and developers about how they use the platform we're providing. All of you are crucial to delivering content, services, and apps to our customers that enable them to have a right for me experience. Our ecosystem runs on you. I'd like to share a favorite quote of mine because it sums up how I feel about our developer community. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thank you all so much for taking the time to go on this adventure with me and all of Samsung. Whose stories will we be telling next year? What will you build next? Thank you. <laughs>